Yo, yo, just a disclaimer, this podcast is meant for informational purposes only. We are not financial advisors, so please do your own research. Uh, What's up, everybody? We're back. Uh, I am Vernon Wells, and I am the Robin to my Batman co-host, AJ Vaynerchuk. Um, Big week, big things happening. Um, Obviously, in the baseball world, history happened in Toronto with Aaron Judge tying Roger Maris. and the ball ending up in the bullpen, which is yeah. makes it even more of just a funny story for me. Um, and Frankie Lasagna just missing out on what history making. Yeah, what a name! First off, second off, your arm needs to get a little longer, or your ball skills need to get a little better, Frankie. So we need to work on that. Um, maybe play a little catch with some of the pitchers in the bullpen. That'll help. Um, but yeah, that's hitting sixty-one home runs in the big was leagues it, is was it, um... absolutely ridiculous. Was it the 61 ball or is it the 62 ball that that memorabilia or auction house has the bounty on? Yeah, I, I would think it'd be the 62 ball, but I've, right, I've yeah. kind of gone back and forth over the 61 or 62. Right. Uh, so he's at 61, yeah? Yeah. And let's just – we may be completely wrong, but for the point I'm making, the fact that now every Aaron Judge game, your you know, $100 ticket to the outfield – is now your access pass to a potential $2 million outcome is wild when you think about it in terms of how, and also like, when will it happen? Will it happen? How many games are left? Like a handful just or the so, weekend, right? Just the weekend series, yeah. Is that right? Are we down to? Yeah, we're down to that right? now. Yeah. So what do they got? They got the Orioles tonight at home, Orioles tomorrow at home, Orioles Sunday at home, Rangers on the road Monday. Oh, we got a few more games. Rangers on the road Tuesday. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. They finished. Yeah, they finished at a Rangers different time. Rangers on the now. road Wednesday, and then we're done. So he's got six more games, I think. He literally oh, plays six days straight. Wow, he's coming right in my backyard. Row. I may go sit in the outfield somewhere. Vernon, let's make a deal. If you catch sixty-two at at the Rangers game next week, we turn it into an NFT and don't sell it to the auction house. Oh yes, let's do it. Is it going to be right. weird if like if no one's sitting behind home plate and everybody's just trying to pack in the outfield? It's going to be. Wouldn't that be funny? It would be, be funny. The one thing that I'll throw out there that's a little concerning is I think it's a little dangerous. Like that ball is in the air. I think there's going to be some issues in terms of like the scrum boxing out. Like people are going to be falling over. Drinks are going to fly. Like when you have two million dollars on the line, it could get kind of interesting. So that that's on my mind. Yeah, the good thing is, is like most people do not really understand the trajectory of a baseball and where it's going to land. Um, so if I put myself out there, I think I have a better chance of, you if it's remotely in my space, I should have a better chance of getting to it unless unless somebody out there is just out for death. So if that's the case, then all bets are off. I can't bet against human nature when there's $2 million floating in the air. But... Yeah, I think Vegas would have you as the odds-on favorite uh, if that ball goes up in the air in your general vicinity. You should. I'll be disappointed if Frankie Lasagna snags it out in front of you. Just saying. That's true, but I, I and, and and I haven't disclosed my injury yet. Um, oh, you're hurt. And it's kind of, it, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. I dropped a really big water bottle on my big toe perfectly, fractured the tip of it. Like, who does Are that? Are you serious? Like, oh. I'm serious. Yeah. Right after, uh, right after, right after recovering from COVID, I decided to do that, and it happened late at night. I'm grabbing it out of out of the refrigerator, so I can't yell or anything because everybody's sleeping. So it was it was like, it was a really funny scene. Yeah. I wish there was a camera in there because. And then there's nothing and, they can do, right? A fractured toe is just it just heals. Like there's nothing. Did they yeah. put like a little? No, no, nothing, no they like, they told me to wear slim? a boot, and I'm like, why yeah, am I wearing this nah, big old boot for a boot. toe? I'm like, screw that, no. So yeah, it's not it's not like you're trying to get back on the field. No, but I will re-injure it for two million dollars. So we'll see if that happens. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. What about uh, what about basketball? NBA preseason. I actually think I'm gonna either I'm going to a game next week. I haven't decided yet. I'm working through it. I'm either going to the Nets Monday or the next Tuesday. What? Uh, how hyped are you for basketball to be back? Well, it's it's kind of sad. Um, Warriors opening opening up preseason schedule and. In another country, which means games are early. And for some reason, my eyes shot open at 5.15 in the morning and uh, ended up watching the Warriors play. And I really like what I saw. I was immediately awake and alert to know how just how deep that roster is. 
Um, but with anything, yeah. it's health. You got to keep your stars healthy. No question. Are there any uh, any players in particular you're excited to watch this year that you're just excited to see grow, take the next step, or maybe a rookie that you're excited by? Well, I think I think everybody like me being in the Dallas Fourth area and watching Luca from day one um, and what he's been able to do. It's at this at, at the, in the speed of which he does it. Like it seems like he's moving in slow motion, but he, he gets to any spot that right. he wants to, anytime he wants to. Um, but I think as far as individuals, not necessarily. I think there's just so many storylines uh, yeah. with the NBA. I think they do such a good job of just 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 high drama all the time. And some yeah. players bring the drama themselves. But like, there's just so many storylines with the Suns, with the Nets, with uh, can the Warriors repeat? Can the Lakers yep. figure it out? We're playing together. Like, there's just so many different storylines. What are the Celtics going to do without like right. their head coach? Like, there's yeah. There's, there's so many questions, and then you have the Knicks, and nobody really cares. So That's not true. 50% of this phone call or this Zoom or this podcast, whatever we're doing right now, cares. I care. The key question, <laughs> the key storylines, can Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle and Obi Ty- – like, the, the number one thing the Knicks need to figure out is how does their ta- – talent? because they actually have pretty good talent, mm-hmm. they do. but it's not very naturally fitting together, right? There's a lot of reasons why you could say, I don't think – a Brunson, Randall, Barrett trio actually is super smooth working together. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that'll be the key question is, all right, you got a collection of talent, but how does that talent actually work? How does it operate? You know, Brunson's more of a ball in hand guy. So is Julius. And then realistically, RJ has the highest upside of anybody, but is his growth being stunted by the fact that he's surrounded by a great player? Like, you know, Brunson and Randall have both had real production in the NBA. How does that hurt? RJ or how does it help RJ and so I'm interested by that obviously selfishly as a Knicks fan and then I'll say the one team that I'm excited to watch too again there's a personal tie to it is um is the Pistons just because mm-hmm. you know Jane and Ivy somebody that is extremely fun to watch our business partner Brandon Parker on the football side is a Purdue alum Purdue basketball guy so I, I was familiar with Jaden and, and then also um Jalen Duran who we as an agency worked with for NIL Um, We don't represent NBA players, so he's since, you know, gone to the NBA. He's there. So, you know, for for them to have, you know, two young lottery picks, one of which that I have a personal, you know, uh, history with, and then Jaden, I just think, is one of the more entertaining players. So, you know, I don't – the Pistons haven't been appointment viewing for a long time, but, you know, if I'm seeing a random Pistons-Rockets game on TV, I'm I'm dialing into that. So I'm excited to have it back. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And back to the Knicks. I think Brunson is is kind of a is, is a glue guy, um, and he's he was that in college. He was yep. he, when he had his opportunities he was out with the Mavs. Um, yep. So, like you said, there's just there's the dynamic of that team is just different, and it has been different. Um, yeah, you got you, Thibodeau as a coach, yeah. and there's yeah, it's just about all right. You got playoff talent. Are you right. going to be able to create a playoff team? That's the question they're going to have to face. So yeah. they did it two years ago. They failed last year, and year three with Thibodeau and Jalen's a real talented player that did some really good things down in Dallas. So I'm hopeful. I like, I like the chance to get into the playoffs this year. I think so. Uh, the East, but you know what? It was funny for most of my life. I got to lean on like, you know, even though they never made the playoffs, it was like, well, the East isn't good, but the East it's like, that's not the story anymore. The East. Actually, no, the East has gotten pretty damn a lot good better. It, it had a very, very long run of not being good. The East. Oh in yeah. General. Oh yeah. Outside of, you know, Outside of Le- like LeBron slash Cleveland and Miami, so the one seed was always kind of figured out. But then after that, it was like you know the Celtics ebbed and flowed. They were pretty good for sure. But like there's been like a ten to fifteen year period where the East was just not good. So well, yeah, um, and LeBron was a big reason of that though. Like it was just it was demoralizing like, for everyone else. They knew there, they, there was a there was an end there was an end that was coming if LeBron was still in the East. Like right, that's who was coming yeah. out of the East. Yeah. Um. Last thing we'll touch on before we bring on our guest. Um, we just wrapped up the fifth black card auction. It was, uh, for lack of a better term, fucking epic. Um, I was bummed because – so the auction ended up running almost two hours past the end date. Vern, do you know – I'm not even sure if you intimately understand, like, how the auction ends. Are you familiar with, like, the mechanic that we have that technically – Vaguely. Ends? Yeah. So yes. just to fill it in for those that didn't catch this. So I think yesterday's auction – was set to end at 3 o'clock Eastern p.m. 
But if there's a bid in the final five minutes at any point at anywhere up and down in the top 10, the auction gets reset to five minutes left. So, you know, at three o'clock comes and if somebody at 258 makes a bid, the auction now ends at 303. And then somebody comes in at 301. Now it ends at 306. I believe the 3 p.m. end auction actually ended, I think it was 451 p.m. We had nearly two hours of jockeying and bids and, you know, the, the rankings changing and it was really awesome. It was a really tight race. Yeah. Um, and honestly, what I'm beyond fascinated, and I'm not saying this to drive demand. I'm not trying to create FOMO. I think everybody knows what it is. And I think people see that I'm not trying to over promise and under deliver with black card. I am so, so fascinated to see how this last auction goes. Cause this is our last auction. There's 70 black cards, but this is the last auction where it's this open market Vayner sports pass bidding with your Vayner sports pass inventory. And then the final 10 we're keeping in the treasury and we're doing different types of activations with. So this is the last auction 51 through 60. And all it really takes is for 11 people to want one of those final 10. And I think it's going to create a really, really interesting dynamic because I mean, we had, we had an hour and 51 of extended bidding for that auction but everybody that was extending the bid had to know in the back of their mind that they had at least one more shot next week. This is it. This next one, 51 through 60. Right. If there's 11, if there's 12, if there's 13, if there's 18 people that want a black card, this is your final shot to do it. And I'm really, really fascinated to see how it nets out. I have no idea. And I honestly, I've been pleasantly surprised in every auction with how it's gone. And yeah. I'm really dialed in on this last one. And it ends on prime time. Uh, at least in the East Coast. I think the auction ends at 9 p.m. Eastern uh, during Thursday night football. I've blocked off my calendar. I'll be fully available. I'll be in a stream. I'll be in the Discord. Um, I'm curious what NFL game I'll be watching, too. What will I be watching? I will be watching Colts Broncos. Do we have a Colt? Yeah, we got a Colt. Anyway, um, so that's what's on my I will, mind. I will not card. be watching that game. You can watch that game. I will Colts not Broncos. be watching that game. No. No, thank you. Um, what time is it? an interesting story. Uh, the prime time, Thursday night. Prime? No, no, no. Thursday, Thursday night. Oh, Thursday. Oh, next Thursday. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully, no. I probably will end up watching it. I don't really have much of a life, so let's just be real. Uh, I'll probably be sitting in my house watching it. So yes, I'll be joining I, you. I, I, there's a chance that the black card auction might be more interesting than that game. We'll see. I both those teams, both those teams are in a little bit of a self discovery process. Both the you know the Colts won one and one, which is an awesome record. Uh, you know, big win against the Chiefs, and then Denver. You know, yet Russ, new team, new new coach, new front office. Everything's new in Denver, so everybody's figuring it out. Um, very important game for both teams, so that'll be interesting. That will be interesting, yeah. But the black card stuff is it's pretty awesome. Sitting on the sidelines, watching um, what you guys are are doing with each auction, and the value that you guys are even giving back to winners and things like that. Like it's, it's pretty fun to watch, pretty fun to see how you guys have built this thing and it's how well it's doing. So kudos Appreciate to you it, and the team again. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it, brother. Uh, on that note, let's, uh, let's bring on our guest. I'm, I'm super excited to have Alex on. Somebody I've known for a while. Um, he's had a really cool entrepreneurial journey. Uh, probably most well known for being on the, uh, the team with uh goblin town so excited to grab alex and bring him on hey alex welcome to the show brother hey thanks for having me good to have you um let's start with a little bit of background um obviously you're neck deep and everything web three these days but you and i first met in the context of web two can you talk a little bit just about your career and how it all came up to this point yeah um you know i was born and raised in new york and uh got into like the new york tech scene right when you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, right when it was sort of like taken off. And um, I worked at a company called Aviary. It was a photo editing company. Um, great people at the t on the team. Um, really learned a lot there. And uh, ended up, the company ended up getting acquired by Adobe. But I ended up joining a company called Dwalla uh, in 2012. And Dwalla was one of the first companies in the, in the crypto space. It was uh, how you got money into uh, all these Bitcoin exchanges. Um, so when I joined... My co-founder and I, uh, Michael Schoenfeld, we joined um, in 2012, and I think Bitcoin was, you know, it was definitely sub five dollars, but it was, it was a, uh, it was like a really early, really early days when, you know, by the time it got to like forty to hundred dollars, we all thought, you know, we we were rich. Um, 
you know, little, little did we know where things were going to go, but um, you know, you basically fund your Dewall account and you move it to BitInstant and Bitstamp and Silk Road and Mt. Gox and all those fun places. Um, and uh, yeah. So how to front row seat to a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So my, I've been in crypto for in some form for the past, you know, decade. Um, and even when we left in 2014 and started our own company, we were still, you know, we had an Ethereum rig in the office in, in our New York office that, you know, we didn't have to pay electricity for. And we had, you know, um, we, we did the ICO game and we did the, the DeFi game and NFT game. So we were always there. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so then we ended up starting a company called Social Rank, uh, social media analytics company. Um, and we were trying to like, basically make it really easy for people to dig into who follows who on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, we built that up to like 100K in MRR. Um, you know, Vayner was a customer. Um, and we, you know, we had the NBA, the NFL, Netflix, Samsung, you know, it was a, a lot of blue chip, you know, companies that were um, paying us for, it was basically like you could see if you're The Rock and you want to see who your followers are in Chicago that have the word mom in their bio, you could do that in like two seconds. Um, and it still works. Uh, just the problem is, it's so dependent on Twitter and Instagram for the for the data yeah. that we just we couldn't um, we like knew we had a ceiling. Like especially when Cambridge Analytica scandal sort of hit the news, they just started rolling back what you could do. And actually, right. it's, it's it's interesting because that um, that experience led us to be like we're never building on top of anyone ever again. You know what I mean? Like we're going to own our thing. Yep. If we win or lose, we don't care. I mean, we obviously care. We, we don't care if we, um, it, you want to like, be in control of your own destiny, in control of our own destiny. Exactly. So, mm-hmm. so we ended up, um, starting uh, upstream and upstream was, uh, in the beginning days, it was like, how do you, um, you're like, well, like what's the future of community specifically professional community. And, you know, COVID was sort of rearing its head beginning of 2020. And it was very clear that it was virtual events, virtual communities. And, uh, you know, that that started taking off. You know, we were like a fun way to connect with people and meet people during COVID. And then um, one of the most popular communities on Upstream was the sort of Web3 NFT community that I started with Drew. And we just started thinking last year about like, what is the Web3, you know, blockchain play for community? Because we had the blockchain experience, you know. And then we also had the community experience. So we felt like we were like really good position to like become that company. And it was very clear that it was a DAO. And we started to dig into how you start DAOs, how do you join DAOs. And um, we found pretty quickly that starting a DAO and joining DAO and and managing a DAO is really, really, you know, um, annoying and really cumbersome. And there wasn't really like a Shopify or Squarespace type of experience for starting DAOs. And there wasn't really just like a centralized location where you can manage all the stuff for your DAO. So we ended up building that and uh, really just took off and we ended up raising our series A in earlier this year in March. And one of the ideas we had around, um, uh, around, you know, DAOs and starting DAOs and, and um, you know, that really led to truth labs, which is Illuminati NFT in mm-hmm. Goblin town is when we did, you know, I, I, and this was an, you know, unrelated to upstream, uh, but me being the sort of the connecting tissue, I partnered with, two friends, well, one friend and then someone who's become a friend, uh, Cesar Curiam, who's the founder of One Second Every Day, and then Process Gray, who's the artist. And um, we just had this idea of like, if the, Illum- if the Illuminati existed, it sort of like would probably be a DAO to some degree. Um, and actually, since we've launched it, a lot of entities that call themselves the Illuminati have reached out. Um, <laughs> but the, um, and I don't know who's real and who's not. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, who, who, how do we verify who is and is Illuminati, but nonetheless. I don't know. We're, we're Illuminati NFT. So right. I don't think it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, to be mistaken. But the, um, you know, this is like iconic, you know, the iconography of the pyramid mm-hmm. in the eye. We thought, you know, and, and Gray is just such a great artist. We felt like we could do some really cool stuff there. And the idea was 50% of the mint was going to go into this DAO that basically was going directly back to the, the, the minters and giving them a, a token that they can vote and, and decide things to do with it. So for example, one of the things that they're doing is actually coming out. Um, by the way, is this live or is this recorded? Recorded. Recorded. Okay. <laughs> no. Yeah. And, and if, you know, anything that you want edited, cut out, like we got. No, you. don't worry. I, you could take everything I say. I will be very deliberate in what I say, but um. <laughs> 
No, the uh, on it's going to be on Monday. We're going to announce in a few minutes. But on Monday, so the Dow has put together this project. Uh, it's internally called OPP, and it stands for Operation Prepunks. And basically, someone in in our community found a contract that predates punks by three four months, um, and it is an and is an, the first known attempt for on chain identity for Ethereum like basically avatars. And mm -hmm. and when the person came out with it, they were trying to build like a gravatar avatar on the blockchain type of thing. Yep, yep. It was at a hackathon. It was quickly abandoned and someone in our community found it and we we, <coughs> we came up with some really interesting ways to bring it back. Um, so it's going to be launching that everyone who owns an Illuminati will be able to claim a free one nice. on Monday. And nice. then it'll have like 30 days to claim it. And then we're doing a raffle for goblins. And then we're doing a pre -mint that anyone can sort of, um, you know, apply for. And what's cool about it is it's um, it's obviously something historical. Right. But then you actually build your avatar. So we're trying to stay as true to the original, you know, thing as possible. You actually built your avatar. Um, and because you're building it, you're making the art. So similar to the way that QQL is and Tyler mm -hmm. Hobbs is doing the percentage, uh, everyone who mints their um, OPP, and there's a name for it. We, we have all the domains. We just don't want you. anyone to sort of front run it. But um, anyone who... Um, Anyone who uh, mints it will get 3% on future royalties for their item as it sells. So it. you mint an avatar and you sell it for 0.3. Well, first of all, you get that initial amount. And then let's say some of the next person sells it for one ETH. You get 3% of that. And then on and on and on. So it's a, it, it, and, and it's not a security because you actually, you know, the whole Howie test about like, is something yeah, yeah, yeah. or not? This is like almost, you doing the work. It's almost as if each avatar is its own project and each person that mm -hmm. made is the project creator that's entitled to the royalties. Yep. Exactly. And Very I think cool. a lot of people will start to do that and involve the community in some form of the art creation so that they can legally um, you right. know, do it without being you know, deemed a security. But anyway, right. so that's, that's just something that the DAO, we spent, I think, 30 to 40 ETH to, to, to put it all together and hire the devs, do all the stuff. Yep. And that's, that's coming out. Cool. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and then obviously we have, you know, we launched Goblin Town and that was, uh, something that we, um, you know, I can tell you all about it and how we started it and how yeah, we're, we're, you know, I'm, I'm sure, sure people are going to be interested in where, where, where it's going, but it's, um, yeah. there's, there's a lot of fun things we're doing with that right now. So I'll leave it at that and have it. No, answer. that's, that's a, pr a great place to stop. Um, before Vernon started front run you on a question, but before we keep going, I just do want to disclose that. Uh, my fund, Maynard Fund, is an investor in Upstream. So just noting that just because, you know, in this industry, there's so much deception and front running and underhanded stuff. So I just want people to know that, yeah, Alex and I are friends. And then through our friendship, he brought us the opportunity and our fund invested in Upstream. So I wanted to flag that. And I'll also upstream, note. Not, and, well, and also, I think you yeah. I think you have some either goblins or yeah, Illuminati's or something. I was, I was just going to make this. I was just about to say the same yeah. thing. You actually gave me a dope honorary Vayner Sports inspired Illuminati. Yeah. Uh, and then I think I have a few other, <coughs> two or three other Illuminatis that I bought. And then uh, I also scooped two goblins off secondary. So I got that in the bag too. So Yeah. And also, disclosure. you could also say that you had no idea that I was goblins. Until yeah. Like, so that's actually a really fun part of I the have, story. I have a text message from you being like, dude, let me tell me. <laughs> yeah. Nobody like, knew. Uh, Drew didn't I don't, even know. No, Drew, I know, Drew I know. and I talk I every day. No, I know. Uh, that That's actually a really, you know, you kind of skip to a really fun aspect of the story, but I, I think people will be interested to hear the whole Goblin Town story, but we'll go on a tangent for five seconds. I will say, and I, I you know, if you look at my Twitter account, right now it's 99% Vayner Sports Pass related, and then, or Vayner Sports related. Uh, I've never, you know, you look at me and my brother, pretty stark dichotomy between how much content he creates organically and authentically and how much I create. But I actually pro like what you know. Goblin Town had so much buzz around this reveal of who the team is, da da da. And then when it was you and your team, completely blown away by it because you know we're in a DAO together and and all this stuff, and we know each other for a while. And it was just like so cool. Yeah. Like that was such a cool NFT moment was that reveal and the fact that it was you and the fact that you kept it a secret from ninety nine point nine percent of your network. I think there was probably a handful of people that probably knew outside of the team. No, really no one outside the team really knew amazing. at all. It's amazing. So um, and and you could you could see the proof in, in the matter is the fact that like Illuminati's didn't run until after it was revealed. Right. Right. Um and you would have seen some sort of like run up if people yep. actually knew. Um yep. and that's like everything in this space. So everything, you know, like every 
thing that has ever happened in this space. You know, an insider group here is first. They make a little totally, run on it. Totally. The outside. And this was like a, 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 a pure thing, which was, yeah. um, which is not normal for, no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> you know, the space. So, well, yeah. every, each, each time we talk to somebody that's not from the sports world, I quickly start to realize that my friend group was wrong once I stopped playing baseball. Like, you, what, what you guys have, have built and have known for years, I was just, my circles of friends is, I, I really needed to go about that a different way, which is kind of awesome, too, because I get to kind of see the history of everything that's being built and has been built. So, for me, knowing your background knowing what you've what you built and then leading to goblin town what gave you just the ability to know or think or hope that goblin town is going to be a hit yeah so it's a great it, it's a great question and it also like probably ties to like how it came to be yeah so please. when we originally launched illuminati um uh nft the original contract uh, had an issue where the gas was like going up every time. So uh, we started to realize it after like 100 or, or 150 of them. And um, it was a very small fix. But the problem with, you know, Web3 is it's immutable. So we had to uh, kill the contract and 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 uh, we basically airdrop. It, it ended up stopping at 187. And um, we ended up airdropping everyone their equivalent in the new contract. And then it continued to mint out and it minted out. You know, it was like a pre-mint and then and then a public sale. Um, but those 187 that sort of came to be, we ended up initially just turning them into gold Illuminatis. We just made them all gold. And we're just like, this is the gold collection. Mm -hmm. But then inside the, um, inside the Discord, they just started referring to themselves as the 187. Uh, and then they got like a little title and they got a little group in there. And if you owned one, you can get in it. And... Um, <clears throat> we had already been thinking of like an expanded universe that we wanted to build, you know, the, the, um, the Illuminati, uh, you know, NFTs were sort of like this initial thing, but there was this whole, we have a few guys on the team that are, you know, Caesar used to work at Marvel back in the day. And it's just like, th there's like world building, um, mm -hmm. you know, type of, you know, people. Um, I like to consume the world building. I'm not the world builder, but the, um, so we were like, they were really inspired by like, you know, Star Wars and, and Fifth Element and, and Potterverse and Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, all these things. So, mm -hmm. you know, we were, we were um, already like planning some form of thing. And then we realized, okay, we have this collection, these, the 187, why not make these maybe like the species, right, of the universe that we're building? So think of like Star Wars, you've got the Sith and the Jedi, you've got Darth Vader, mm -hmm. and then you've got, you know, Ewoks and Wookiees and whatever Yoda is and whatever Jar Jar Binks is and, and like the, you know, the, the cantina mm -hmm. and all those different characters there. And like, w why can't we have, um, you know, th why can't these characters be that? So we ended we, uh, and also like, we didn't reveal those characters. They sat there. We ended up changing it from gold to this. We just started calling them the 187. And then we made this like little visual and they basically sat there from January to June and was as low as one and a half ETH and then speculation started or whatever. Anyway, once we had the idea of Goblin Town in, in May, <clears throat> and I think we've said this a few places, and by the way, apologies for the coughing because I'm coming off of being sick. Um, the, uh, um, we, from start to launch, uh, it was it was like a little bit more than a week for Goblin Town to ideation to launch, and the reason why we could do that that fast is we have just a really talented team. Every, there's ten of us. Everyone's really good at what they do. You know, this person owns the lore, and this person owns Web three, and this person owns design. This person owns art. And this person owns creative. So we were we were really good at like doing things really fast once we had good ideas. And you know, the market went from like three thousand ETH. It was three thousand to two thousand basically overnight. And, you know, everyone was saying, like, you know, the, it's the concept from Lord of the Rings, you know, and the Hobbit down, down to Goblin Town. When everyone loses all their money, they go to Goblin Town. And, um, you know, we, we basically, like, we're like, hey, wouldn't it be, like, funny if everyone changed their profile photos to a goblin, right? And once we had that idea, we're like, wait, how about if a goblin is part of the 187? And then we start to reveal, because we were already up to, like, 30, 40 characters that we had made, but we hadn't revealed any of them. And we had a unique idea where we would start revealing one a week 
and like introducing like these rich character stories. So if you actually go to the 187.xyz, you can you can see the characters. There's only 12 or 14 or 15 that have been revealed so far. And if you click in, there's like a whole like Pokemon card on the back where like there's like different mm-hmm. levels and talents and stories about them. So we said, how about we reveal the first three 187s and then we reveal the fourth one and it's a goblin and that's when we'll dox ourselves. So <clears throat> we had these characters that we were building. We had this idea around around Goblin Town and how this could be like our Star Wars cantina type of thing. Um, and uh, and then we sort of put it out there and we said, okay, let's let's be anonymous because um, you know it was actually right around. Um, I think it was like Caesar came up with the idea. And it was right around. So it said, you know, usually products projects are tied to whatever they, that came before them, right? So like. You launch, you have V Friends, and then you launch V Friends Two. It's usually a percentage. It's a bigger collection, smaller price, etc. And we thought, like, why does that need need to be like that? It doesn't necessarily need to. Let's let whatever we do for Goblin Town should be like the unexpected thing. So whatever anyone does for a collection, let's do basically the opposite. So no Discord, no you know, no roadmap, no utility, nothing. It doesn't mean we're not doing those. Well, well, we're not right. doing a Discord. It doesn't mean we're not. We don't have a roadmap. I have a roadmap in my my Google Doc. I could look through and tell you exactly what's happening. It just means you start putting out a roadmap, right, for a project like this. It's like imagine I would give you like the, you know, the whole story of Harry Potter, like right when I drop like book one, right? Like ruins the story. Like you, yeah, you want to know that like Snape kills Dumbledore. Sorry, spoiler alert. From like <laughs> Ten years ago, like you know, you don't want to know that. So it's. It's um and, and that's that that is frustrating for some people who are like you know degen flipping in and out of projects. They're like, well, I want to know this thing. I want the yeah. thing. I want I want to sell. But I think like you know if you start doing things for people who are trying to get out of your community, you just you're making the wrong you're making the exactly. wrong decisions. Yep. Um. So anyway, that that's the so you know we we came up with the idea of Goblin Town. We put it out there. We were anonymous, which it you know led to crazy speculation on who was what. We try to tamper some of that stuff. You know, the only one, you know, we were sort of joking over the Beeple thing. And then the like, right. Know, we made, everyone thought, you know, it, it was funny. Beeple came to our NFT NYC party and we were talking to him and we were like, why did you like talk about like, like right. we, we, we were making fun of everyone. We said, yeah, yeah, we're definitely uh, Steve Aoki. I think we're definitely Shaq. We're definitely Snoop Dogg. I think we even said we're definitely like Gary V. Like yeah. we basically went down the list and then we said we're definitely Beeple. Because everyone was speculating. So anytime mm-hmm. someone would guess, we would retweet them, quote retweet them, and say, like, yep, we're definitely that person. <clears throat> and only Beeple was the one who was like, this, you know, it, like whatever. Engage and, yeah, yeah engage with it. And he, he told us because he was hacked like a week or two before that. Remember those like hacks that went mm-hmm. around? Yeah. So I remember. He was hacked and he didn't want people thinking he was some other project. So he like made a comment. He's like, I shouldn't. He's like, if I would have seen that you were joking about being people, right. I would never have stopped. But you were getting so much engagement that I felt like I had to say something. <laughs> um, so that was like funny, yeah, and yeah. you know, a lot of that speculation was 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 fun and funny, and and um, you know, us sitting on the sidelines being really quiet about it, no one knowing that it's us, and sort of just seeing you know, yeah. sort of what's happening was definitely a surreal thing. You know, people were hating us, people were loving us. It was people defending us, going after us. Um, but we always knew we were going to dox. And the idea was to dox like a week or so before uh, NFT NYC so we could do some really fun stuff there. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how that sort of came to be. Um, and then I also have to answer questions on, on yeah. it specifically, but that's that's the gist of it. Let me, let me ask you a specific question about a specific decision you guys made. Um, my, from my perspective, you guys really kicked off like the free mint concept and movement. Can you talk mm-hmm. to me about what went into the idea of making it free as opposed to point one or whatever? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, we made it free on purpose because we wanted to do what we wanted to do and we didn't want anyone to like. And by the way, even though we did that, like people still complain that it was free. I know, which is insane, um, right? It's like, it was free. It's like, you can't win. Free. No, well, well, they're upset that they bought a certain price and, you know, they're That's like, our, and they're, like, you bought it from somebody boy. else. You didn't really buy it from us. Yeah, you gotta and be a like, big, listen, you gotta be a big boy and a big girl in this world. Like, to blame, like, I don't see people blaming Amazon or Tesla or Apple stock if they bought it at the <clears> top and it goes down 20%, like. That's a decision you made, and that's life. 
But that's oh not- no, they definitely blame Tesla and, 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 and Apple when they buy it, you know, the stock and stuff. But the point is, is just like we wanted it so that we can do. We we wanted everything in Goblin Town to be free, so that we can do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it, without the fear that like it would go below the mint price, right? Like you know, there's no <laughs> unless you know can't go, can't go negative. You can't can't go negative. So at least not um, yet. Well, unless maybe I don't know, maybe take out a loan, a loan DAO or something, oh, and, then you, and then you go, you, you know, you lose your shares. But the, but the point was keeping keeping it, um, you know, free allowed us to approach the project the way we want to approach it. And you know, everything was free. the The burger claim was free. Yep. The 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 baiting was free. Um, the NFT NYC of stuff was free. The burgers, you know, all the burgers we did there, everything was free. The only thing that cost was like any merch you wanted, but that was, you didn't have to get merch. And we basically try to make it as close to the, you know, we had to put a little adjustment just in case, you know, we didn't hit certain minimums and things, but it, you know, essentially it was like cost. So okay. the idea was like, we're going to, we're going to live and die based on secondaries and we're going to live and, you know, die based on, on performance. Um, and listen, free mint, works if you have a team in place that's already there that can do this stuff the problem with free mint in general is that you know it normally doesn't work and i think we're, we're definitely one of the outliers in terms of oh, yeah. like the free mint because you know if you don't have enough money to sustain to the team's going to be I, I think it's a general problem with nfts and yeah. you know which is you you basically make 95 percent of the money you're ever going to make in the first 48 hours and yep. You know, and then you have people complaining about when this, when that, and and wanting things faster and everything right yep. now. So yep. you know, at a certain point, you're like, all right, I'm, I'm, I, this is this was free. I, you know, whatever. I'm, I, I don't, I don't want to be screamed at all day, and yep. I want to do things that are interesting. I think it's just it's it's tough, right? With with um, even though we said no utility, no roadmap, no this, and still yet people. So yeah. it's, it's difficult. I think there's no, it's like a no win solution type of thing for, for this type of stuff. And that's why anytime we do anything, right, this is, um, we're like, somebody's going to be mad. So we might as well do it the right way, you mm-hmm. know? That's a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. Like free, yeah. cost money. Someone's gonna be yeah. Mad. To that point, how do you like personally as an entrepreneur handle negative sentiment? you know, on Twitter and things like that. Like, how do you digest that? That that last point you just made is a good example of that. But you personally, how do you find that journey and that process? I mean, listen, the first times that you, you like were, are ever rejected in life in a big way, it always really affects you. I remember like the most searing rejection in my life. Um, luckily, I, I, you know, it, and I always say like, it's, you just need some one person to say yes, one person for a job, one person for a yeah. spouse. Like you just really need one person usually to say yes, yeah. one college to say yes. Right. So, um, you know, but I remember um, I was a senior in uh, in college and I wanted to, you know, I did a bunch of internships on Wall Street and this was 2008, 2009, 2010, like here. Yeah, bad like, time. And the econ- very bad time. Um, and I remember I got a bunch of like final round interviews, Goldman, Credit Suisse, all the banks, whatever. And I didn't even really want to do it, but like that was what everyone was doing. So I was like, all right, I'll just follow that path originally. And I remember I was sitting there um, and I got I got a reje- rejection from like final, a bunch of final run. I got one rejection. And then within the next hour, I got another 10 rejections. Like wow. so much so just, fast. You're that just I getting was just rejected. Like, yeah, bang, yeah, like bang, left bang, and right. Bang. And it was just like, whoa, like this is not me. There's no way yeah. this is all me. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, right. And I was like, you know what? It, it just made me like, it, it toughened me up and it made me like, all right, like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to get rejected. That's fine. I'm just going to like, I'm going to figure it out. And I figured it out and I figured out and I joined, went into the startup space and stuff like that. I, I think um, seeing negative stuff on Twitter, listen, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, that say this and say that. And if anyone makes a legitimate claim or they mm-hmm. claim I said something that I didn't say or, or I, we're doing something that is nefarious to this, I obviously have to go and, and, and jump in and put the facts out there for anyone yep. else who's reading. So, you know, there was someone who was saying that I tweeted something and I deleted it. And then when I actually looked at it, it well, I didn't delete any tweet. The person who replied to me deleted the tweet. Who was the person who was saying the thing? So I was like, all right, listen, I, I don't really care about what you're saying, but 
let me here's the yeah, clean right. Yeah, right. right here's the factual stuff anyone who's reading this can do whatever they want with that information but like you're claiming i'm like i'm hiding something or deleting something so anyway the, the long and the short of it is you know um i think it speaks more on the person right than it does on 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 like the person who's saying something it usually listen there's legitimate criticism for people of course don't get me wrong there's yeah. people who do bad stuff and people get called out but if you're like you have good intentions and you're working hard and stuff like that and someone is saying something or they're upset about something or they're you know trying to trying to rile you up or something it usually says more about them and and their like you know unhappiness than yeah. it usually does about the person that they're going after so you know i typically try to lead with like you know either explaining as a legitimate situation and like what are the facts and what are not or just like you know sort of feeling bad for them and 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 you know knowing that like the fact that they have to go out and try to bring people down to make themselves feel better is yeah. is, is a is a pretty you know dark thing for somebody yeah and i think i think it what you said is should be hopefully speak to a lot of people too is like okay i got rejected i got rejected and i basically had to look at myself and like this isn't who i am like I'm going to, I'm going to figure this thing out. Now in society, a lot of people are like, well, I'm getting rejected. So I'm just going to, that's going to be my thought. I'm just, I'm not, the, I'm not who I thought I was. So I'm just going to give up um, and use that as an excuse to not be who they are, which I get it. It's the strength of some people's it's, it's not of others, but then you, then you talk it's about tough. social media. Yeah, it's tough. And yeah. you talk about social media and you talk about just the ability for people to, speak their mind and not have to put a face to it and it, half the stuff they say they wouldn't say to your face. Um, so yeah, you have to be able to, to navigate through that stuff and understand you never know what that person's going through, what they're trying to, they're, are they trying to bring you down to their level? A lot of times I see stuff and people say stuff. I usually try to have fun with it. Like that's, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's yeah. kind of the way no, that's, that's, what, that's, yeah. that's one way to approach it for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it could be very demoralizing a lot of times also when like someone says something and maybe there's a hint of truth to it, you know, or, or maybe there isn't. And it could be really demoralizing and really bring you down um, when you have really good intentions. Um, I think there are also a lot of bad actors in the, in the space mm -hmm. in general. So yep. it's just like, you know, maybe some people can't tell the difference between a good actor and a bad actor. I think a lot of people also are young in this space. I think a lot yeah. of people are young and they don't have any, you know, like it would, you would think that sometimes certain things would affect prices and things the way you, and they don't because the people don't understand the implications of like the fact that this, the, they raised money is like, that means they, they're going to be around longer. They're going to do more things. But some people take that, at, you know, it's not a good thing. You know, yep. truth labs, we're probably not going to raise money. We've been offered money from people, but just doesn't make sense for us. We, we have enough money from secondaries and we just also, you know, the team is, you know, we have a, a, a good sort of situation for the team where money for us maybe would change the um, motivations. You know, they, they, you know, maybe investors would want us to make money as opposed to trying to make our people money, you know, like the people, the holders money. Yeah. Not always, but, but sometimes. So, um, but I, I understand it. I mean, it, it, it can be like rejection, uh, you know, people saying m mean things. I mean, listen, I sat there for 30 days, people saying, you know, they hate us. We're the worst. This is the worst art in the world. You know, it, yes. it, that was funny for me. Um, yeah. Again, but we did it. We made it free. So we didn't feel like we had, we we're mm -hmm. beholden to any, right. oh, these people bought it and we have to do good right. by them. Like, we want to do, obviously, we want to build something really special and really long yeah, term. Yeah, yeah. But we also felt like we can go about it the way we want to go about it yeah, you're and not the dead. way we want to approach it. And that we don't have to just because someone wants a, an exit pump. Like, we're not we, we're not going to do that. You know, we're, we're going to go and, and build it out the way we want. And we believe that if we do that, it will be worth more long term than if we do short term pumpy type, right. type of things that just, you know, may pump the price a little bit. But long term isn't really going to do much. That's what I talk a lot about with Vayner Sports Pass is one of my favorite quotes in business, at least some variation of it, is like if Henry Ford listened to the customer, he would have built a faster horse instead of a car, right? And so, you know, your holders, you have to be really cognizant of what their intentions are, right? So if your intentions, it sounds like you and I have the same, is like we want to build long-standing, sustaining, great projects. And then in turn, a ramification of that is, 
the floor price will go up or whatever, right? Where you get a lot of people complaining is the short-term flipper or the short-term investor or the young and naive investor where they want you to make a decision that will benefit the project in like a very finite, quick little window, but will actually in turn depreciate the brand, hurt the upside, and in turn make you not accomplish your long lasting goal. And so I'm always telling people in the community, like, hey, you should do this. And I, I say, if I do that, that'll help serve a few hundred people that care about themselves. They don't care about the project. My job is to care about the project. And then mm-hmm. in turn, it'll work out. So I, I resonate that with completely. I hear that. Yeah. What, no, about, it's, it's big what, about, what about the NFT space in general? You know, obviously right now conditions are a little chilly. Um, what has you excited in the NFT ecosystem beyond, you know, truth and Goblin Town, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of projects that I think are really cool. Um, I think, I think we're, we're in a prolonged bear market. I think there'll be pumps here and there, you know, the projects that come out that people get excited about and, yep. you know, they goes through its normal, you know, thing and you can never do enough fast enough that, you know, so yep. um, it goes through the, you know, remember that like startup view, like the tros of like a startup and it's like, yeah. You know, excitement you know it's it, there's like there's a similar version yeah that's just that's consolidated for, for NFT. yeah <laughs> it just happens in like 40 hours exactly. like, um but the the um i think i've been thinking a lot about like how do we get out of the bear right mm-hmm. like what what is the next bull and i think there's two things that could be the catalysts uh for this um, cause I think a lot more about mechanics, like, I, um, than I do about like, oh, I'm excited about this project. So for example, yep. like two recent, two recent ones are like, um, like, uh, Renga or Regna or whatever, yeah, yeah. That, whatever yep. it's called. Yep. Like yep. It's, it's doing really well. A lot of people really like it. Um, but I think the mechanic of the box opening, right. With the mm-hmm. NFT and you open the box, you break the box. I think that's really cool. And that's a mechanic that I'm thinking like, okay, where does that work in my universe and what can I do with that? type of mechanic as opposed to like i think the art's cool and i think the community is cool and they're they're doing cool stuff but i i care more about mechanics the other mechanic i was re- like really like recently is uh the the d gods youth thing where mm-hmm. you know hype no hype whatever but the application yeah. process to the community i think that's really cool and want to like sort of explore that and see like okay what does that look like you know bu- you sort of building your own little community on something so that's the stuff that excites me there but in terms of getting out of the bear i think that there's two things that will lead to it I think one is 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 DAOs, which I'm obviously begging, you know, you know, spending a lot of time on, and the other is uh, sort of metaverse and gaming, and um, the ways that I see it. So, in terms of metaverse and gaming, metaverses take off when there's uh, your friends are there, there's fun games, and then you can make money, and all this stuff ties back to making money because really, in the end of the day, we're talking about programmable money. So, but if your friends are there and there's fun games and you can make money, metaverses will take off, and and usually. Those three things, you know, are pretty tied closely with games. So I think it's if 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 there are you know fun games to play, your friends are there too, and there's ways to make money on it. That would that will be a like a like a, a rush into it. Yep. The other side is the DAOs, where I think that um, you know you know we're in a, uh, you know investment club together, and there's the investment club style, and then there's like yep. NFT projects that have DAOs, like the Illuminati. I think that that actually the Constitution DAO had a lot of things mm, right, even though yeah. they sort of like they didn't win the thing and the, there yeah. were mistakes that they made. But I think generally making a community around a big ticket item, because originally the Constitution DAO was going to go for like two and a half million dollars. They ended up having to raise 40 because they were sort of like playing their cards publicly. But and they got a lot of hoopla. But I think the um, the concept of building a community, right, I, I'm starting to call these like community DAOs, even yeah. though it's sort of like using the same word twice. Um, I think like picking a big ticket item and building a DAO around it, um, as like the sort of the reason for existing. So like, let's take an example. Link's DAO is one, right? Yes. But like, let's take an example. Let's take like, uh, LeBron James, right? So let's take, let's call it LeBron DAO, right? And LeBron DAO is all about basketball and sports and, and LeBron, right? It's like, he's the, the, the one true God of this DAO and, the thing that we're going to do is we're going to buy the first game that LeBron ever played, game worn jersey, yep. you know, on the, on the Cavs, signed in, in a case, and we're going to put it in a museum and whatever, and it's going for like a million and a half bucks, right? And we get some info that LeBron's retiring next year. 
So we know that this million and a half bucks is going to be worth at least a few million more. Um, and it's going to be a really sought after item. So we go and we raise the money, we buy the item. And now, you know, we distribute a, a governance token. You know, I joined, I joined the constitution DAO. I put in 200 bucks. I walked away with 2000 bucks because the people like the speculation around that token. And I think that there's something really interesting. Obviously there's a few legal things you need to sort of sort out in terms of this, but I think that there's, there's a, it, why did NFTs take off? NFTs take off, took off because you went and you bought an NFT for 500 bucks and then you sold it for 5,000 bucks. And then you told your friend, you're like, look yep. what I did. And they're like, holy yep. shit, I want to do that yep. too. And then yep. they did it and they told their friends. And then maybe they started their own project. And some of that, some of those communities were people flipping in and out. Some of them are long-term lasting communities. And I think the speculation is, is good and interesting and, and it creates a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, notice and, 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 you know, just makes it something that, you know, it's not a small niche thing. It gets, starts getting bigger. So I think DAOs are similar to that. That style is very similar to like DeFi where like, if people can make money, right. Then they will tell their friends and their friends yep. and their friends and friends and friends. And then I think this, so I think those two things, the metaverse and gaming and the DAOs are, have the potential to be the, the catalyst out of the bear uh, where, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm betting obviously big on, yeah. well, I'm betting on both of them in some ways, but yep. I'm, uh, those are the things that I'm, I'm most excited about now, the mechanics and, and getting yep. out of the bear. Even though Goblin Town, being in Goblin Town during a bear is not a bad place to live. <laughs> um, what about accessibility? So that's what my answer would be if I'm talking about getting out of the bear. I think back to like, I've manually onboarded some of my normal friends and mm -hmm. If I didn't put in like an extraordinary, first of all, like I know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and then I put in a lot of effort holding their hand to get them to the place where they could set up MetaMask, buy Ethereum, get onto OpenSea, understand the dynamics. What do you think about accessibility in the NFT space? I think, um, I think it's obviously to get really big, it, you need regular people. So, you know, in the future. And I also think this was part of the hope for like Coinbase NFT. Yep. Is like the custodial stuff and like the millions of people who have crypto because people understand how to do that. But I think, um, I think, I think it's obviously think so something that needs to be solved. I also do think it's a young person's game, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of young people can figure this out. I think this is a, a, also like a once in a lifetime opportunity or maybe like a twice in a lifetime, like the internet starting mobile. I think web three yeah. is, 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 yeah. is on that level. I know a lot of people say, Oh, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of critics on, on, on Twitter and, and whatnot. But I think um, like ownership and transparency and having it all public. Yes. You can do all the same stuff. It just, you now own the thing. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like I think the big thing that a lot of these people who debate about like the, the merits of Web3 they miss is like, it's not that it's that different. The only thing is that like the people own it now as right. opposed to the, the companies own it. There will still be companies, like it's just the portability of all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I just think that um, uh, young people will figure it out. And I think if you want to bring on older people or less technical people, there definitely needs to be a lot of like, yeah on ramps but i think that that also takes time yep. like i think we're in in the phase of like we're like pre-aol right you know yeah pre-aol yeah, pre -AOL, yeah and, aol bundled up the and internet when aol comes out everyone starts to use the internet but before aol people aren't really using it and then when google comes out it makes it even more accessible so i don't know yep. i think we're like a pre-aol phase right now and you know someone will come Makes out sense. and hopefully they don't build a walled garden um right you know, and, and they sort of, you know, make it nice and open. So, yep. um, I don't know. Yeah. I think yeah, that makes sense. General thoughts on that. So obviously I'm talking to two, two veterans in the space. Um, but for new people coming in would, and this is kind of my thought of it too. It's like, you kind of gravitate to the people who have been through a couple different bear markets who have been through from the beginning, through all the struggles to where it is currently trusting those people who are behind these projects, trusting the people behind the projects that have been through it more so than the newest thing that comes out. Um, would, would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think people who have been around the block, they've sort of seen it all, you know, I've seen 
Ethereum and Bitcoin drop so many times that like it just doesn't phase me anymore. Um, right. I think we've 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 reached beyond the past of like no return. So like to think these things are going to disappear with all the infrastructure that's been in place, like banks are getting ready to hold crypto. Yep. Like yep. over the next two years, and that's why a lot of these companies like Block Daemons and Fireblocks have really taken off because the like. Like the people that think crypto is done are the people who thought crypto was done after ICOs, right? And, yep. you know, and ICOs was just like an early version of like what you could do with the token. There was really nothing behind a white paper. Now the next phase was like, now you have art or you have some sort of like decentralized finance thing. If you think that there's nothing coming beyond that, <clears throat> then you just haven't really read any of like the, the, the actual like Ethereum foundation stuff of like, what you can do. Um, so I don't know. I, I think like it goes through phases. And I think a lot of the, the, the OGs and the vets will just tell you like, hey, listen, you could leave now. But like, it's sort of like leaving after the stock market crashes, right? Historically, the stock right. market has always come back. Yep. And like, yeah, you're going to lose money. And it's, you know, it, it, if you take your money out now, but if you go and you flash forward 10 years from now, my bet is that the market will probably be up. Yep. From where it is, you know, now. So, or where, or even where it was at the peak. So that, right. that, that's, I think the, um, the sort of like the, 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 the vets that have been around, like can zoom out a little bit because they've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Awesome, brother. This was great, man. I really appreciate you joining yeah. us for the combo. Very, very excited to see what's to come for Goblin Town. And yeah, this was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Going Deep. To learn more about Vayner Sports Pass, please follow us on Twitter at VS Pass. Also, don't forget to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel.